According to the World Wildlife Fund, more than 85% of fisheries around the globe have been pushed to or beyond their natural limits because of overfishing. But as one commercial fisherman found out, just because there are fewer fish left to catch doesn't mean our oceans can't continue to feed us. Former commercial fisherman turned innovator Bren Smith is dedicated to satisfying our cravings with sustainable shellfish and seaweed while simultaneously restoring the ocean's ecosystem. I met Bren at the 2015 annual meeting of the Clinton Global Initiative, and he shared with me his creation of the world's first sustainable and affordable three-dimensional ocean farm, a proven alternative for fishermen who can no longer depend on a declining catch from the sea. Okay, Bren, mm -hmm. um, what you're doing uh, in fish fishing, the industry of fishing, is so revolutionary. You came from being a commercial fisherman to then becoming a sustainable fisherman. Yeah. How did that transition happen for yeah. you? Yeah. So I always think of, I think of it as a journey of ecological redemption. So I'm a high school dropout at the age of 14, grew up in Newfoundland, Canada, little town of, you know, a couple houses, fishing co-op. And um, at 14, I headed out to sea, and I fished all over the globe. I fished off the Bering Sea, and Russia, and Grand Banks, Georgia's Banks. I really fished for everything. But the trouble was, as a kid, I was just, the timing was, it was the height of industrialized fishing. So we were just ripping up entire ecosystems, fishing in illegal waters. Um, uh, I've thrown tens of thousands of pounds of dead bycatch into the sea. You know, I love my job, and we didn't really know at that time, you know, as fishermen. But um, over, uh, at some point, it was just clear it wasn't sustainable, mainly because the cod stocks crashed in Newfoundland in my home. So then there was a whole generation of us. We were all younger, and we, we decided to go on this search for sustainability. We were the generation which believed in science, I think. we were able to, and the scientists were telling us this was the beginning of the end. It was really important. And then to see in my hometown Overnight, people thrown out of work, boats beached, canneries shuttered, and just to see the sort of violence of that in a way, and the shock to the system was a really a, a wake-up call. Um, and I think, um, and then we were also, you know, it was a generation of wanting to innovate, right, and not wanting to just work on the big boats, on the big factory trawlers, but actually running our own boats, our own businesses. So it was sort of a search for that, you know, a self-direction. I think that was a big impulse. I mean, it sounds like a sort of a reinvention, right? And you have to be willing to do that as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, so you really actually pushed that uh, to an extreme because you came up with an idea that nobody really had thought of, 3D yeah. ocean farming. Yeah. First of all, tell us what that even means. Sure. So it's imagine an underwater garden. So it's vertical. And on the top, we have these floating long lines. And we're growing um, seaweeds like kelp and grassalaria, mussels, scallops, oysters, all hanging down. And the key is, is um, there are a couple benefits to it. One is it's got a very small footprint because we're using the whole water column. Um, and it has a low aesthetic impact, which is important because our oceans are these beautiful, pristine places. Um, you know, our goal is not to create Iowa pig farms at sea, essentially, which was the, what happened in the 80s. Like agriculture, and I w used to work on the salmon farms as I was searching for sustainability, and it was just repeating the same mistakes in different ways. So our model, very small footprint, at the same time it's zero inputs. So we only grow species that require no fresh water, no animal feed, no fish feed, no fertilizer, and the, it makes it the most sustainable food on the planet. And it's going to be the most affordable food on the planet someday because the price of moving water in the era of drought, the price of um, uh, um, uh, using fertilizer, which is getting more and more expensive, land, we're running out of arable land, zero input food is going to be food not just for the elite restaurants, but it's going to be sort of the Gordon's fish stick of the future. So, and then the other thing is our farms restore rather than deplete. So no, it's not just not putting you know, zero inputs, but also... Um, our kelp soaks up five times more carbon than land-based plants. So I think of our transforming the fishermen into climate farmers, where they can actually not only adapt, but help address issues of climate change. Our oysters soak up nitrogen, which is the cause of dead zones. And then the whole farms function as um, our artificial reef systems. So as our coral reefs and oyster reefs disappear, um, we need new foundations for the whole ecosystem to right. thrive. So now that the best fishing in the whole area 
is on my farm. Wow. Uh, and I think that's key. Well, it's not just sustainable, but going beyond sustainability to actually um, restore it and figure out new systems. I was just going to say, it's a, you're almost rebuilding part of the ocean and its ecosystem. You've been very frank in some of your talks mm. about what we've done to this planet and particularly the oceans. I mean, I think there, you, I'm going to quote you, you said, we've screwed things up. Yeah, yeah. And you can't get more blunt than that. Yeah. And, but we really have, haven't we? Yeah. And, you know, I say that based on experience. This isn't theoretical. It, um, as shell fishermen and fishermen and now ocean farmers, we're on the front lines of climate change. Acidification is, and water temperature increases is driving lobsters, for example, north out of the, um, uh, in my hometown. Um, it used to be a huge thriving industry. Now you cannot find a lobster anywhere. Acidification is weakening oyster shells. One out of four marine species are expected to die in the, in the uh, go into extinction, extinction in the next hundred years. I mean, this is crisis time. And so, you know, I'm not an environmentalist as a background. I've just confronted the environmental um, uh, limits and, and crises we're facing. Do you see enough being done, you know, in your line of work? Mm. Or is there still a resistance from traditional uh, fishing uh, fishermen and industries? Yeah. Are they still saying, no, 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 we're doing it fine? Yeah. I think there are a couple points of resistance. I mean, first, I was getting laughed off the water when people <laughs> sure. started, um, you know, fishermen found out I was growing plants. You know, like we chase and hunt things for a living, right? right. I grew up clubbing seals, you know, like for oh, real. But, um, uh, and that's our background. And now, now I'm like an arugula farmer at sea. Um, uh, I will just say this uh, thing, which is the potential here is gigantic. There are 10,000 edible plants in the ocean. This is just the beginning of an exploration of, imagine being a chef and having never seen arugula, tomatoes, kale, like being introduced to these new vegetables. It's such an exciting time, uh, but at the same time, scary. But you asked about some of the some of the stumbling blocks. So I think fishermen want to stay the same course, many, um, but they're running out of fish. So we had a meeting uh, last year, and just a little local meeting, um, and 40 fishermen showed up, and that was stunning. And it's mainly because their nets are coming up empty. Um, I think there's resistance from the ocean conserva conservation world who really want to, which I really, I believe in, is create massive conservation zones. And these are good things. The trouble is, is they don't con confront the realities of climate change unless we have these engines of remediation and restoration, which soak up carbon, deal with nitrogen, but also feed the planet. Um, the, we could set aside the entire ocean and it's still going to die. Right, you need to incorporate this, these new new crises we face of climate change right. acidification, and I, I understand where they are. You know, um, uh, 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 in terms of fear of developing the oceans, and their experience with agriculture was so bad as was mine. Mm. But we need to find this sweet spot between conservation and um, sort of restorative uh, techniques. And what I see in the future is a hundreds of small scale ocean farms surrounded by conservation zones. The, the ocean farms are, are the engines of restoration yep. while we protect huge swaths. Yeah, I mean, if it's replenishing exactly. the ocean, then it just makes sense. So it still has to make money. Yeah. It still has to be profitable. Yeah. And therefore, sometimes businesses are willing to sacrifice yeah. the environment yeah. um, to make that extra buck. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so is this a viable business that people can you know, profit off of yeah. as well as saving the planet? Yeah. So I think we don't know yet. Mm. Um, because um, sea vegetables especially, we can make some money on shellfish, you know, some of the products we, we're growing on the farm, but I think um, sea vegetables are the game changer, betting those, because we can grow such a high volume. Um, you know, if you were to take a network of the farms totaling the size of Washington State, you could feed the world, right? We can grow an incredible amount of food, and it's cheap to grow because I don't have to feed it, right? right? right. All, it's sort of a lazy job. All I have to do <laughs> is go out once every two weeks, and make sure my lines are at the right height so it's getting the right level of light and, and nitrogen and things like that. Um, uh, so I think, um, yeah, I, th I think the possibility uh, is huge. What we need to do is create value-added products. Yeah. So take this, we do a, a kelp noodle, for example. Um, uh, we have these noodle machines and we cut it up and you get kind of a fettuccine noodle and, mm -hmm. and it freezes very well because kelp fr uh, freezes and thaws naturally in its yeah. environment. Yeah. So it stays al dente and it's a really, um, uh, sort of successful dish that we do. do I know York. you have kelp 
cocktails and yeah. kelp ice cream and yeah. you know being of asian background korean yeah uh we eat seafood, oh, seaweed yeah. all the time yeah, yeah. and it's highly nutritious exactly um we make seaweed soup for pregnant mothers exactly because yeah. it's such good nutrition yeah. so yeah. It's it's almost like an image thing. Yes. People have to understand, you know, the taste of it and the, exactly. you know, what you can do with it, really. And we're trying to desucify seaweed for American palates. Right. Right. I mean, you know, places like Noma and Copenhagen are are the whole idea is to create a new indigenous diet based on what we're able to grow. Everything is imported, and imported food isn't. It's a great thing, right? Um, the trouble is, is um, we can't be shipping food hundreds, you know, thousands of miles and things like that, and we need to grow it sustainable. So we're trying to de it. So we like kelp because it doesn't taste like seaweed mm. when it's cooked. It's a great entrance, in, entrance point. Um, uh, the other thing about these farms is it's not just food. We love sea vegetables because we can turn it into biofuel. We turn it into fertilizer. We turn it into animal feed. I mean, it's animal feed's fascinating. If you, you, you feed cows, uh, majority kelp diet, there's a 90% reduction in, in methane output. Oh my right? gosh. And, wow. an, and fish feed and animal feed is, are really unsustainable. It's all corn and soy or wild fish. Right. So here we have plants, zero inputs, and we're feeding it to our protein. Um, but we can do ocean based um, uh, uh, biofuel and um, just not run into any, any of those problems. We also use it in pharmaceuticals, cosmetics. So they're at every point of the value chain or or leftover pieces of kelp we can go somewhere we actually have farms just in polluted areas and all they do is soak up heavy metals nitrogen um, like in the bronx river here um, and then that goes into biofuel so we're actually it's just remediation stays out of the food system but we can clean up our harbors with it so it's the it's the it's the versatility and all these possible avenues of income yeah. which i think reduces risk but it, it really makes it a powerful engine. amazing versatility i had no idea yeah. so nature seems to have the answer for everything but we like you said we screwed it up yeah yeah but now you are trying to fix it yeah and my i see you know my role is just to nurture and to figure out how to grow these good beautiful things yeah. and then um you know make sure it's healthy and just species selection is key I mean, in some ways, we're trying to not make all the mistakes that were made on land. Stay away from monoculture. We want to protect our seed base um, so it's not privatized. We want to make sure that leasing systems and land ownership, you have access from, for beginning farmers and new farmers, all these different elements. Um, uh, this is our chance to rethink it and do it right. Yeah. And to think, like you said, you were 14 years old, dropped out of high school, and now you're here at CGI about to receive an award from President Clinton. Mm, life is weird. Go figure. <laughs> life is weird, yeah. Could, did yeah. you even imagine that no. anything like this would happen? No, nothing. nothing. Not, not for a minute. Not for a minute. Yeah. So what's next for you then? Well, so we started a, a nonprofit called Green Wave, and Green Wave's role is to replicate the farms. Uh, so we have eight new farms um, uh, started, um, and it's uh, both on the East Coast, and then we're starting some on the West Coast. Um, and then build infrastructure, so we have, we have a hatchery that we've built, and we're building a seafood hub. It's the country's first seafood hub, which will do the processing, develop the value-added products, do the fertilizer, biofuels, kelp noodles. It's sort of an incubator space. Right. And we trust spinning out of that will be all these entrepreneurial efforts of people. Like, so I had a kid. We work at the Bridgeport Sound School, which is an inner city school. I had a kid take my kelp and, and um, uh, invent a 12-volt a uh, kelp-powered biodegradable battery out of kelp yeah so wow. like it's just you know like <laughs> i can't even imagine what people are, are going to do and hopefully i'll disappear at some point and people will run with this and 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 make the model better and just innovate but so infrastructure um and then the third piece is market development so our farmers need stable markets just as they grow um, and so we're working with a whole bunch of other institutions, Google and other places, mm. to create a stable market uh, for our farmers. I'll say that our farmer training program is, uh, what we offer is we, uh, a, a grant for each farmer, about $1,000. They get free seed. They get free gear from Patagonia. They get two years of consulting so that my team can pass on the mistakes that we made right. over 15 years so they can scale up. Uh, very quickly, and then we promise to buy 80% of everything they grow. Oh, wow. So the farmers just have a guarantee that they'll be okay for three, four, five years, which just stabilizes them and will mean they'll be able to uh, be successful. And then our support will fade, but they'll be 
you know, off and running. So kind of low risk to yeah, get into yeah, it. Yeah, because yeah. farming, farming is really, really hard. Working with Mother Nature is wonderful and difficult. Yeah. And um, uh, we need the farmers both to you know, stabilize that risk and own more of the value chain. For generations, farmers and fishermen have been selling raw products, uh, uh, and it's a beggar's game, quite honestly. Like the fishermen need to own and and have the infrastructure to develop that. And so we're we're also organized under a co-op model, which is helpful because it allows us to share resources, um, to pool our crops, so we can meet, we can supply to big buyers. Makes sense. Like that. So we're just exper You know, there's so much we don't know, yeah. and I I think all of our work will be look even it will, different in five years, but this is sort of how we're beginning to piece it together. And what we're trying to do is build an industry from scratch. Yeah. Um, in other countries, very often you take, say, the solar industry or actually the seaweed industry in, in um, Asia, and it's subsidized by the government with the trust that you're going to have all this economic activity that spins off. Right? We don't do that very much in this country for good or bad. Yeah. What GreenWave is trying to do is sort of replicate that. And so we take a mix of private investment, foundation money, um, uh, individual donors, and try to piece together to recreate that. We'll build a foundation with just the trust that it's going to take off after but that. But it makes sense, you know? If you have that kind of cooperation from all sides, yeah. then th a better chance to be successful that way. Exactly, so, exactly. And uh, you're leading the way, Bren. So congratulations on that. We look forward to hearing much more about what you're doing. Thanks so much. Honored to be here. Yeah, thank you.